Well, I mentioned at the beginning, the scriptures today talk about the fact that God has no favorites. But I grew up at a time in the 50s when we thought Catholics were the favorites. <laughs> One true church, you know. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't that we were guaranteed to be saved in the kingdom, but we certainly had advantages. When I grew up in grade school, my best friends were these two twin brothers, and their one brother was one year older, and they were all Episcopalians, Protestants. And we did all the things that we naturally would do as kids in the back hills of Wine and Skill. Got in trouble from time to time. But the thing was, every Saturday I could go down to St. Jude's and go to confession, which meant I got a clean slate. <laughs> And I could start all over. My friends, all their sins kept piling up and piling up and piling up. Sister had told us in school that all people can be saved. But it's important to remember that it's easier for Catholics. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, that worked for me. <laughs> The issue, of course, is that uh, sometimes we can get a little bit uh, self-satisfied and condescending when it comes to religion. That was the case with the, our ancestors in the faith, Jewish people. See, in the first reading today in the book of Isaiah, it tells a story about the uh, exiles returning to their homeland. You might remember the, the background people of uh, Israel were the leadership, I should say, the leadership of Israel was very um, much interested in developing lucrative trade groups with some of the big powers in the area. And the big competition was between Babylon, present-day Iraq, and Egypt. And so, depending on who made the better deal, they're the ones who got the trade groups. Well, our ancestors settled the making of the arrangements with the Egyptians at this time. And when the Babylonians found out, they came down and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They attacked the whole place. Took the first thing, the top five, ten percent of literate people, and sent them off into exile to live in Babylon. And this went on for about 40 years. But then when things changed in the international scene, the Persians, present-day Iran, became more powerful. They attacked the Babylonians, present-day Iraq. And when they won the battle, they allowed the refugees of Judea to return to their home. And that was an independent country that the province of the true Persian Empire. But the people saw it as God's work using this pagan, Cyrus, king of Persia to free them from their bondage and exile from Babylon. And so they saw themselves as being favored. They were chosen. That was the belief. They were the chosen people. Well, <clears throat> the section of the book of Isaiah today begins with the third section. The first section was in the original Isaiah, the prophet in the 7th century B.C. The second section was when they were being uh, tested to go off to exile. The third section is called Trito Isaiah, third Isaiah, about when they're coming back home. So when they're coming back home, Isaiah, the prophet, speaking the word of the Lord, says, as you just heard, that he's going to welcome people from all the different lands, from North Africa, from Tarshish, from southern Spain, from any place where they have foreign languages, and all are going to be invited to worship the Lord on the holy mountain. Everyone is equal in God's eyes. No favors. Well, the conservative people found this a bit much. <laughs> they felt they should have an advantage. Just like we did when we were Catholics in the 50s. <laughs> should have an advantage. But as I say, God shows no partiality. God doesn't have any favors. And his blessing is available to all people. 
who are willing to follow the path. The second reading today, we see people are going through some hard times. The letter to the Hebrews was written to people who had been raised in the Jewish state, but are now set to Jesus as the Messiah. And because of that, they are um, suffering some persecution within their own family. Some members of their families feel they have betrayed their traditions by believing in this Jesus as Messiah. The Roman state saw them as <coughs> uh, unpatriotic because they wouldn't worship the emperor. They worship Jesus instead. And so they're going through this, what they consider persecution, hard times. And they're beginning to wonder, why is God doing this to us? And the scripture makes the point. It's not that you're being punished. It's being, it's you're learning some discipline. Just like when a father disciplines his son. What's the background of that? Well, again, in the Jewish tradition, a woman was not really <clears throat> fully integrated into her husband's families until she produced a male heir. Produced a little boy. And when she produced a little boy, she was honored to be accepted in the whole family. And the thing was, <coughs> Children, both the boys and the girls, were raised by the women in the village. And the women's world was really separate from the men's world. So the kids, boys and girls, lived with the women, the men kind of on their own. And everything was fine. The little boys were treated with a lot of uh, special attention because, after all, this was their entrance into, you know, the same part of the family. And they were just really spoiled brats. So <laughs> okay, until so puberty sets in, now it's time to go live with a man. And those little patsies <laughs> had a real hard time. Because the men wanted to pack, uh, grow up and start acting like a man. Well, some of them want to go back to the women again. <laughs> and it says in the Book of Wisdom, Father's responsibility is to discipline his son, to make him sure of his role in the world, and to have convictions about how he used to live his life, and not to always be pampered by his mommy. And that's the image they use about explaining while these new Christians are having raised to the faith are now feeling persecuted, but he says it's really discipline. See it as this. It's going to make you a better person. Just like, you know, when you're a kid and your father says, This is going to hurt me more than you. You know what you can? I'm going to wait in that. We use those terms. And that's what this person is trying to say. It's going to be a power of the Lord that has make changes in your life. What do you need to do to be saved? What do you need to do? 
many years ago when Rich Broderick was here, he had these windows put in. And whether you know it or not, this is the criteria for entrance into the kingdom. Corporate works of mercy. Drink to the thirsty, visit the imprisoned, clothing the naked, visiting the sick. What you do for other people is what changes your heart. What you do for other people is what gives you access to the kingdom. There's nothing up there about what religion do you belong to. You go to Mass every Sunday. How much did you give to the Bishop's Appeal? <laughs> it's all more a question of, do you ever care about anybody else? That's the criteria. And that's what makes it available to anyone who wishes to be a follower of the Lord. The problem is that we've made God in our own image. And that we don't really believe that everybody is equal. <clears throat> You've heard me say before that uh, Chesterton said, Man was created in the image and likeness of God. Then he turned around and returned the compliment. <laughs> we make God just like us. When I was growing up, I thought God was like an Irish Catholic Democrat. <laughs> That's all I knew. That's all the good people who are Irish Catholic Democrats. God must be like that, right? With all the Irish Catholic Democrat prejudices and everything else. That's not who God is. God's bigger than us. We have to be able to allow ourselves to be pulled in a different direction, to open our hearts to all people, just as God has no favorites, neither should we. And yet we do play those religious games. And we do make judgments about other people. When I was in the south end of Albany, St. John's down on Green Street, there was a woman in our gospel choir, Beulah Banks, and people said, you know, her daughter's a nun. I said, really? So I got talking to her one day, and she said, yeah. My daughter, Jackie, when she graduated from St. John's High School, Back in the 50s, she decided she wanted to be a nun. So she went to the Daughters of Charity to see about becoming a sister. And the Daughters of Charity said, well, we're sorry, dear, but we don't accept black girls in our community. Oh, my God. But there is a group in Harlem of black sisters who work with black kids, and maybe you should go there. Now, if I were that girl, <laughs> I would have had a different response <laughs> to the mother superior at the con. <laughs> but that's the way it was. The sin of racism was strong in our Catholic Church back in the 50s. It still is in many ways. So what happened? By the time I got there, there was a special celebration one weekend for Sister Jacqueline, because she did go to Harlem. She did become a nun, and we were celebrating her 25th anniversary, and she was principal of a school in Harlem. That woman was able to rise above the sinfulness of the Catholic Church in order to continue her calling to be an instrument of God's love. It's a reminder that sometimes people have had it tough, and yet the question is, do you rise above the brokenness of our institution? Catholic Church has had a long history of throwing people out. <laughs> we all know that. I remember when I was a kid, my Uncle Bill, <clears throat> my father's, one of my father's brothers, they told me the story that when he was out of high school, he was fooling around with his girlfriend, and she got pregnant. Being good Irish Catholic Democrats, <laughs> my grandparents dragged him down to the priest house so they would get married by the priest. That's what you did when the girl's pregnant. So he did that. Well, a couple of months later, it turned out not in his church. This is before the days of annulments, taking a look at marriages, whether they're valid or not. And so what happened was, he went to the Korean War, came back, 
Found a nice girl in Ward of Elite, nice Presbyterian girl, <laughs> and got married, started raising a family, living in Ward of Elite. Well, his older sister, my aunt, my father's oldest sister, was a nun who taught at St. Bridget's School. And while she was teaching one day, fourth grade, I think it was, she told me, the new priest in the parish knocked on the door. He had found out that my uncle was living in the parish without benefit of a Catholic marriage. And he said to my aunt, can I see you for a minute, sister? So she, you know, she leaves the 60 kids in the classroom for a minute. <laughs> and he says, sister, it's come to my attention. Your brother is not living in a Catholic marriage. So after school today, I want you to go over and tell him he has to leave that woman. God bless my aunt. <laughs> she just kind of bit her lip and said, Father, there are children involved. Children who, by the way, had all been baptized Catholic. <laughs> but again, this priest was ready to throw them out because they weren't married in the church. Those things might have happened in your family too. There might have been instances where somebody in your family got thrown out. <laughs> Maybe not literally, but psychologically. And that stuff continues. And they wonder why, you know, look around. <laughs> Lots of empty seats. <laughs> A lot of these people got thrown out. <laughs> and the reality is, you know, we're, we're trying to play God. We're trying to make rules and regulations for people that have got nothing to do with the criteria for entrance into the kingdom. This is the criteria, not what church you belong to, not what denomination, what sacrament you might have, but whether or not you have a place in your heart for the needs of other people. So let's listen to the scriptures. Let's realize that uh, when all is said and done, uh, God shows no favorites, and neither should we. If you want to create a, an image of God, take it from Jesus. Don't take it from your own personal prejudices because that'll make all the difference, and that'll help you become more dedicated to entrance into the kingdom.